This is a Tantrika Institute recording. Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Happy St. Stephen's Day, as it's known in some places, Boxing Day in others. Um, second day of Christmas, I believe, of the 12 days, or is the 24th the first day? Can't remember. There's a 12 days of Christmas tradition that's mostly forgotten now. Yeah, happy holidays, whatever holiday you celebrate. Of course, as you know, most of you know, in the tantric tradition, it's said that there's no time that's more sacred than any other time. All time is sacred. All existence is sacred. And yet, traditionally, tantrikas double their practice, whatever your standard practice period is, tantrikas double their practice on holidays, on, on religious holidays in the region where they're living in order to, as it were, take advantage of the ambient energy generated by thousands or even millions of people turning their attention to something more profound or sublime than in everyday life. So in other words, the reason tantrikas traditionally double their practice period on, on religious holidays is not because the day is more sacred, but because uh, so many people are, you know, observing it and thereby generating an energy field that we can tap into. And that's the same reason that tantrikas visit uh, sacred sites, pilgrimage sites or temples is not because they're more sacred than other places, but um, only if and only if there are, there's more uh, ambient energy there to tap into. So running energy through one's energy body, of course, is a, is a tantric practice. So whether it's, whether it's festivals, whether it's political protests, whether it's uh, it could, <laughs> parties, it could be anything where there's lots of ambient energy available that you um, pass through your system. So there's many contexts in which tantricas experience aliveness, not just uh, ones that people perceive as positive per se. Um, so, you know, some, some people have the idea, oh, but it's, it's you know, some things are sattvic, like a, like a religious holiday, and other things are rajasic, like, like a uh, political protest. And there's a level on which that's true, but there's also a level on which energy is energy, and uh, energy is enlivening to the body-mind system when processed and digested without judgment. So anyway, we're here to uh, contemplate the non-dual teachings of Jesus, uh, Yeshua bar Yosef, or Yeshua ben Yosef, uh, as he was no doubt called in his own lifetime. And the name Yeshua becomes Jesus in the Greek, um, whereas the modern uh, Hebrew form of the name Yeshua is, of course, Joshua. In other words, Jesus's real name is Josh. <laughs> uh, so maybe that humanizes him a little bit. Um, and of course, he was human. Some people who, you know, who are more on the skeptical end doubt whether he existed, but um, scholars don't doubt that because we have independent attestation of, of his life from people from non-christians you know so let me pause there and say um why i can even teach on this subject because some might say oh this is out out of your scope as a tantric scholar well not exactly because at one time many years ago um i i studied the early jesus movement and new testament scholarship quite intensively i was lucky to have a wonderful teacher at the university of rochester and meredith a uh, great scholar and I got introduced to the work of Elaine Pagels. And many years later, actually only last year, I, or, is it, or is it this year? No, I think it must've been last year. I met Elaine Pagels um, and uh, uh, you know, 
I love the work that she and others have done on the so-called Gnostic Gospels, the non-canonical Gospels of um, spiritual communities that existed in the first, second, and third centuries that were eventually stamped out by the establishment church. So as you might know, when the church gained um, royal favor, as it were, right, when Constantine converted to Christianity and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, then with that political power, they, they basically stamped out all these, all these interesting uh, groups that had different teachings and different traditions. Um, and, and, and some of these were, were Gnostics and their teachings are preserved in a whole array of non-canonical gospels, such as the gospel of Mary Magdalene and the gospel of Peter and the gospel of Thomas and many other texts as well that, that most people um, haven't read. Now of these, there's only one that, uh, according to the best analysis of all the best textual and historical scholars, there's only one of these non-canonical gospels that's equally old to the canonical, canonical gospels, and that's Thomas. So scholars believe uh, the gospel of Thomas was written sometime between uh, the year 70 and the year 140, which makes it just as old as the canonical gospels. And at the Council of Nicaea, when the early church fathers decided what goes in and what goes out, you know, of the of the what came to be called the New Testament, they decided to exclude Thomas for two reasons. They thought it was later, and they were wrong about that. And they thought it was too mystical. That is to say, it was too empowering. <laughs> and you'll see why when we read some of these statements. It if it had gone into the Bible, it would have undermined the authoritarian power of the church um, because it emphasizes individual spiritual experience. It emphasizes the value of um, one's own intuitive insight based on one's practice and, and, uh, and study of the words of Jesus. So, so it was not uh, included, but it is uh, perfectly legitimate or at least has as much claim to legitimacy as the canonical gospels which scholars believe have a mixture of authentic sayings that go back to the historical Jesus as well as some later interpolations especially in John. So I, I could uh, say a lot about the history um, but it's more important to get to the teachings. So there's a fascinating little story around how these non-canonical texts were discovered, the great majority of them belong to what's called the Nag Hammadi Library, which was discovered only in 1945. So a few months after the end of the Second World War, an illiterate Egyptian guy was digging in the sand for some reason. And as he dug, suddenly he saw gold flakes fly through the air. And he's like, oh my gosh, I've discovered a treasure. And what he had discovered was the sealed urn this, uh, that, that contained manuscript scrolls. And this had been sealed and buried way back in about, you know, the year 300 something and undiscovered until 1945. So he didn't know what he'd found. Um, he, you know, opened up this urn, he took home these scrolls, and he thought, oh, maybe, maybe somebody will give me money for these. And so he stashed them in his house. He's a poor man. Um, unfortunately, when her, his mother discovered the scrolls, she decided to use some for kindling, and some texts were thereby lost forever. Um, and then he brought the scrolls to, uh, to, to, to some you know, B-grade scholar who is like, oh, this is important. We found something important here. Um, and that person was using um, the 1945 equivalent of Scotch tape to, to tape some of them together, which ended up being a huge problem for restoration later. Um, anyway, it's a whole story. Eventually the scrolls found their way into the hands of, of the best scholars and have been studied and translated ever since. So in the Nag Hammadi library, there are these two 
texts I'd love to draw your attention to, um, many interesting sources, but two in particular stand out, and that's Gospel of Thomas, um, which I already mentioned. And then uh, there's this extraordinary text called Thunder, Perfect Mind. And it's, what is it actually? We can't even say it's, it's a Gnostic Christian text. It might be a Gnostic text, but not necessarily related to Christianity. It's just happened to be among the scrolls. Um, whoever buried them, you know, decided these are the ones to, to preserve. Um, so I, we don't have time to get into that one today. Um, but I can post a link to it. And this text, Thunder Perfect Mind, claims to be the self-revelation of a female divinity, of a goddess, that speaks in the first person. And it's really extraordinary. It has some resonances with the paradoxical language that we see used in the Tantric Krama texts, including the Chuma Sanketa Prakasha, which I was just sharing with you guys. Um, there's some, some, some resonance there with uh, the way that Para Devi, Para Vak is described. So anyway, um, just so you know of the existence of that and you can uh, check it out and contemplate it for yourself. So we'll just focus today on the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. Okay, so Yeah, so nothing to do the Nag Hammadi library is nothing to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, they come from a, about the same period. But the Dead Sea Scrolls belong to a weird radical extremist not necessarily psychologically healthy group called the Essenes. I mean, a lot of people think that they're something special, but um, to me, they, they just seem like a cult. <laughs> but they actually preserved some materials that they, that they also didn't write. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are also an important historical trove. But the Nag Hammadi library is far more interesting and far more diverse. Great, and so Florentine and Catherine have, have put some links there for you. Um, now, when it comes to um, Gospel of Thomas, there's a couple of good sources. Five good translations are collected on gnosis.org. Always, if you have more, more than one translation available, you should always cross-reference multiple translations in order to get past the idiosyncrasies of the translator, uh, of, of a single translator. Um, so there's one but there's, that I, I link to there on gnosis.org, but there are others as well. Let me give you an alternate translation of um, Thunder Perfect Mind as well. or a couple of alternate translations. So these texts, including the Gospel of Thomas, are written in Coptic Egyptian, but they are translations from Greek. Greek was the lingua franca of the world at that time, of the Mediterranean world. So people who are educated generally um, would write in Greek, just like later in Europe, Latin became the lingua franca. And we don't have the Greek original of the Gospel of Thomas, it's probably lost forever. But we do have this Coptic uh, translation. And so it is, you know, a step removed. Well, it's two step steps removed, because Jesus spoke Aramaic. And there's a couple of Aramaic phrases preserved in the New Testament writings. Um, you know, such as when these words attributed to Jesus when he's on the cross, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, it's actually written in Aramaic in the original, uh, Eloi, Eloi, Lema, Sabachthani. 
and you know so there's little fragments that show that that he was an aramaic speaker um so from aramaic we come to greek and then to coptic egyptian so you shouldn't assume as fundamentalist christians do that when you're reading these words whether canonical or non-canonical gospels that you're reading the exact words of jesus and and therefore you should you know really pay attention and hang everything on on on, on a specific word I mean, you should really pay attention, but <laughs> it, it can't be about the exact choice of words because you're reading an English translation of Coptic, uh, which was translated from Greek, which was translated from Aramaic. So it's got to be about, you know, trying to penetrate to what's behind the words or what they're pointing to without getting too hung up on the exact word choice or on any single word. Okay. So who was this Thomas character? Well, some believe that the gospel of Thomas, that the, the Thomas in question is the so-called doubting Thomas, the one who when, you know, resurrected Jesus appeared was like, come on, is that really you? Let me, let me feel the wound, dude. Let me, let me, let me touch your body here. Um, so, you know, I like to call him critical thinking Thomas <laughs> rather than doubting Thomas. And it is precisely this Thomas who ended up traveling to India. Now, this seems like, you know, yet another um, myth that gets circulated, like the myth that Jesus himself went to India, for which there's no solid evidence. But there is solid evidence uh, to suggest that Thomas did make his way to India and probably died there in Kerala. And Carolan Christianity, um, actually, you know, preserves some Aramaic teachings from Thomas from almost 2000 years ago. And they preserved these teachings in dance and song. And so through dance and song, they were able to preserve this oral transmission. And this has been studied uh, and, and is generally considered to be absolutely authentic. And this tradition of Carolyn Christianity is dying out, unfortunately. So it's completely different from the later Christianity brought by the Portuguese and other colonialists in, in the 15s, 1500s and so on. Um, that's a whole much later overlay. So this original tradition that was there when the Europeans showed up already um, is the one that's uh, in, in danger of dying out. There's a long thread on it in the, in the Tantric Yoga Now group somewhere. Okay, so is this the Thomas who wrote, who, who wrote down the secret teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas? Maybe not. <laughs> you know, so what's interesting is Thomas calls himself Thomas the twin, um, or sorry, Thomas itself means twin. And the only given name he gives is actually Judas. Now, this is not Judas Iscariot, but a different Judas. So he introduces himself at the beginning saying, you know, these are the secret teachings of Jesus. Uh, the, sorry, these are the secret teachings that the living Jesus spoke and Judas the twin wrote down. So the word Thomas means twin. So if it's not a proper name, then his proper name is Judas, Judas the twin. Now, some have speculated that this might be actually Jesus's brother. Jesus had several brothers, at least two of whom became his disciples, James. Um, and maybe Judas is, is his twin brother, or maybe he's James's twin brother. Who knows? You know, and we can't ascertain this at, at, at this point in history. The, um, but possible. It's possible. You know. Anyway, this is certainly someone who claims to have heard these teachings direct from Jesus, and wrote them down. Perhaps he even wrote them down in Greek because he presumably would have known if they were written down in Aramaic, they wouldn't get any currency. Um, so who knows for sure, but um, about 80% of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas have parallels in the canonical Gospels. Um, that's, uh, and then there's some teachings that don't have parallels, and you might not be surprised to learn that the most non-dual teachings are the ones not paralleled. And it's significant, perhaps, that, that Judas, uh, the, the, the scribe here, 
says these are the secret teachings. These are the ones that a few of us received in private. Um, okay, so many, many of you might already know this text. And so you're, you're just, this will be a review for you. But for those who don't know it, it is, it is a, I would say, a revelation. Um, okay. So we'll do a screen share here. Um, so in this particular translation, uh, the translator used the, you know, uh, the original names, the Aramaic names like Yeshua, right? And in other translations, it says that he uses the name Jesus. Um, okay, so the first saying is, and, and by the way, the Gospel of Thomas is only sayings, it's only sutras, it's 114 sutras from, from Yeshua. And there's no narrative, do you know what I mean? There's no, nothing about you know the other the, the canonical gospels all have narrative elements anyway and he said whoever discovers what these sayings mean will not taste death so this is of course a theme in the teachings of jesus that if you become realized or, or awakened as we would say then um, you realize that aspect of yourself, which is unborn and undying, and death becomes meaningless for a fully awakened being. Death becomes um, virtually meaningless, no more significant than, than taking off one's clothes. Saying number two, one that I, I love, um, In another translation, it says, let one who seeks not cease seeking until he finds. And when you find, you will at first be troubled or disturbed. And after having been troubled, then you will marvel or be amazed in other translations. And after that, you will reign or rule over all. So this little little brief um, map of the spiritual path. <laughs> See, seek and don't give up seeking. And then you'll find, you'll discover. You'll discover truth, experiential truth. And you'll probably be disturbed by it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's gonna disconfirm your cultural programming. It's gonna, it's gonna um, disconfirm your ideas about yourself. It's gonna be challenging in some way, you know? And then having gone through this challenging period, then you reach this phase of astonishment, of amazement um, in the process of awakening, you know, and then, and then you will reign or rule over all. Now, that, that sounds like odd language to us, but we find the exact same language in the tantric tradition where it says that the fully realized person is chakreshwara, is a chakreshwara, meaning sovereign over the entire wheel of consciousness. So this language of sovereignty uh, in, the, in the fully awakened being is, is actually pretty ubiquitous in the tantric tradition. And it's you know, surprising because it has connotations of, of power. And you know, we have to kind of investigate, well, what does it mean to, to be the Lord or sovereign, the Ishwara of the total, the totality of the wheel of consciousness. I address this in detail in chapter 20 of the recognition sutras. So it doesn't mean you have control over everything. It means you have the experience alluded to in, in another saying here in the gospel of Thomas actually, um, that all that you're experiencing flows forth from what you are and returns to what you are, merges back into what you are. So this 
experience of being at the center of the cosmic wheel of consciousness. And of course, not just you, that would be megalomania. If you think that all beings, all being there's, it's, there's only one center ultimately. And, you know, this is something that's confounding to the mind that, that, that there could be one center and yet, and yet many at the same time. But we have a parallel from this, uh, in, in, for this in, in quantum physics that talks about entanglement, that is what appears as two different particles or two different photons can actually be a single photon appearing in different places in space time from our vantage point uh, when actually it's, uh, it's, it's a single process that just appears that way in, you know, three and a half D, meaning to say um, the usual three dimensions we experience plus the, the, the fragment of time that we usually experience. Anyway, point is um, that each being, each sentient being correctly sees themselves as the center of the, of the universal mandala. Um, so this is part of what this sovereignty is, is hinting at. Okay, so any of these could, could of course be discussed in, in, in much more detail. I won't, I, maybe I won't share the screen every time because um, there's something to hearing as well but I will share this document um, that I've prepared with you guys. Saying number three, Yeshua said, if your leaders tell you, look, the kingdom of God is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you there. <laughs> They'll beat you to it. <laughs> and if they say to you, it's in the sea, then the fish will precede you. But I say the kingdom is within you and it is outside of you. The kingdom of heaven is within you and outside of you. When you know yourselves, then you will be known and you will understand that you are children of the living father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you dwell in poverty and you are poverty. So it's a really fascinating saying because he says, you know, he, or he strongly implies, you already are children of the one, expressions of the one, I would say, children of the living father. But if you do not know yourself, you do not recognize that. And then the experiences of living in poverty spiritually impoverished and you are that poverty when you do not know yourself and this and this mysterious phrase when you know yourself then you will be known right that there's this co-creative aspect in a sense there's this non-solipsistic aspect meaning to say to know yourself is also to be known by the universe, <laughs> you know, how, how I think if we try to put it into words, it becomes um, overly dichotomous, um, but there's something very profound there to, to contemplate, right? To, to know yourself as you truly are is also to see yourself reflected in all beings, see all beings within you and yourself within them and to share yourself as you are. Okay, so saying number four, we don't have time for all of them, but the first six are all really good. Yeshua said, a person old in days will not hesitate to ask a little child about the place of life. And that person will live. For many of the first will be last and will become a single one. So we see this theme over and over 
uh, in, in, in Jesus's teachings and especially here in the Gospel of Thomas about um, children, about becoming childlike, that to become awake is to become childlike, not childish, <laughs> but in some sense childlike. And, you know, this, this beautiful thing, like a per person old in days who's, who's awakening, one might say, will not hesitate to look to a little child for insight into the, the nature of existence, to ask a little child about the place of life. And that person will live as a result of that, of that insight. And then there's this sort of non-dual statement that comes, many of the first will be last. So we see this theme of inversion quite a bit in Jesus' teachings, right? Um, that, that, that to enter the kingdom of heaven collectively is also um, will humble everyone equally. It's the great leveler, as it were. Those who are high in social status will be, uh, will be humbled, you know. Many of the first will be last and they will become a single one or they will become one and the same in another translation. Right, so they will uh, recognize their innate um, unity and equality. Saying number five, Yeshua said, know that what is in front of your face, no, sorry, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. I would definitely call this a non-dual teaching, right? This notion that the truth is hidden in plain sight. Know what is in front of your face in its real nature. And there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. The inevitability of the awakening process, once it's begun, it cannot fail, right? Um, this, we see this theme in, in uh, the tantric non-dual teachings as well, that, uh, you know, in some cases it might take more than one lifetime, as it were, but it cannot fail. And it parallels also Jed McKenna's teaching, um, awakening is your destiny, more certain than sunrise. Right. Okay, saying number six, his students asked him and said to him, do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? Yeshua dismisses all of that in, in, in more than one saying here in Thomas. Um, and here he says, simply this, do not lie and do not do what you hate. All things are disclosed before heaven or before the truth or in the truth in another translation. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nothing covered that will remain undisclosed. So one, what a wonderful little teaching, this nugget in the middle there. I think that's the important part. His advice, do not lie and do not do what you hate. <laughs> Beautifully simple and, and powerful. Okay, skipping to saying number 11. This one is interesting. It's about impermanence and what is not impermanent. Yeshua said, this heaven will pass away, possibly gesturing to the sky, and the one above it will pass away. Maybe saying even the afterlife is not permanent contrary to later church doctrine. This heaven will pass away and the one above it will pass away. 
The dead are not alive and the living will not die. When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you become two, what will you do? And there's quite a few sayings here in Thomas that are open-ended like that. They're an inquiry that, that doesn't, he doesn't resolve for you. Okay, so we're moving through these, um, you know, quickly, but it's because I, I want to um, share a bunch of them. Maybe some other time we can explore them in more depth. This is one of my favorites. Yeshua said to his students, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. Shimon Kepha, that's Simon Peter, said to him, you are like a just messenger. Matai, Matthew, said to him, you are like a wise philosopher. Thomas, Thomas, said to him, Rabbi, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Yeshua said, I am not your rabbi, your teacher, or your master, because you have drunk. You are intoxicated from the same bubbling spring that I have tended. And he took Thomas and withdrew and spoke some sayings to him. When Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did Yeshua say to you? He said to them, if I tell you what he told me, you would pick up rocks and stone me. Gives me the, the tingles, <laughs> you know, there are indeed, you know, it's like the, some of the non-dual teachings when expressed, um, you know, bluntly, they cause people to recoil or rebel. We're not going to get into that can of worms right now. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of teachers today who will express these radically non-dual teachings without, without apology. Um, like Jed McKenna and, and Byron Katie. Um, yeah, <laughs> I won't get into that right now, but let's come back to the, what I think is the key part of this saying, where Thomas says, rabbi, which means both teacher and, and has the connotations of, of master or someone you're kind of putting on a pedestal looking up to, um, you know, he, he calls Jesus rabbi and jesus immediately says this surprising thing i'm i'm not your teacher i was but not anymore because you have drunk and become intoxicated from the same bubbling spring that i have tended when you awaken then you know you you need to see in me that which i see in you and vice versa so we awakening is again this leveler that um, eliminates hierarchy so again this, these are teachings that the established uh, church was not um, so happy about Saying number 18, the student said to Yeshua, tell us how our end will be. Yeshua said, have you discovered the beginning that you are now seeking the end? Where the beginning is, the end will be. 
blessings on you who stand at the beginning. You will know the end and will not taste death. Some teachers um, of non-duality say, I think quite rightly, what we do in spiritual practice, what we do in daily practice is begin again. We begin again every day. That's the whole practice. You know, even when you're just sitting in meditation, it's like I, I tell people this sometimes, if, um, if a half hour meditation is too long for you, just do three 10 minute meditations in a row. <laughs> Begin again. Saying 20, the student said to Yeshua, tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. He said to them, it is like a mustard seed the tiniest, tiniest of seeds. But when it falls on well-prepared soil, it produces a great plant that becomes a shelter for all the birds of heaven. Yeah. This one's amazing, right? That this, and, and he says, of course, in the canonical gospels, you know, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed, which is very small, right? It's that big. <laughs> and you nurture that, you tend to that, right? The well-prepared soil is like your, your spiritual practice, you know? In time, this tiny seed becomes a plant that shelters all the birds of heaven. saying 22. Yeshua saw some babies nursing. He said to his students, these nursing babies are like those who will enter the kingdom. Right? And we see this theme a lot, this, uh, that, that the whole goal of the of spiritual practice, according to Yeshua, is to enter the kingdom of heaven, which of course he's not talking about something that happens after you physically die. And he makes that clear later on kingdom of heaven is just his term for the awakened condition. So these nursing babies are like those who enter the kingdom. They said to him, then shall we enter the kingdom as babies? Yeshua said to them, when you make the two into one, when you make the inner like the outer and the outer like the inner and the upper like the lower, And when you make male and female into a single one, so that the man will not be male, nor the woman female, then you will enter the kingdom. Yeah. So this parallels the tantric teaching on samarasya. Samarasya. Um, is the experience of that everything is equally a manifestation of the one, right? It's uh, also called ekarasa, the one taste. Everything tastes like God, as it were. And also this important like allusion to transcending our cultural programming, because of course, um, gender is a cultural construct. And we're distinguishing here of biological sex from gender. Gender is a cultural construct, as is, you know, a very popular subject in our 2020 world. Um, and, and people are realizing, oh, gender is a cultural construct, therefore it's fluid, therefore I can identify as whatever gender I want. But what he's talking about here is, is transcending dichotomies, right? When he says, um, you will make the male and female into a single one. It's 
It's really, really fascinating stuff and extraordinary for his time and place. Maria asks, is it possible that Aramaic is a non-dual language? No, I think I think Yeshua was a non-dual, you know, and 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 each non-dual teacher strives to make language as non-dual as possible, but language is inherently dualistic because words have meaning through excluding other possibilities, right? That's the doctrine of exclusion in the linguistic theory of of um, Indian philosophy is that a, a word means X by excluding all that's not X, that language is inherently dualistic. Okay. A few more sayings. Yeshua said, love your brother like your soul. Protect that person like the pupil of your eye. Another one, Yeshua said, from morning to evening and from evening to morning, do not worry about what you will wear. We could interpret, don't worry about what costume you put on, <laughs> what character the, the one plays. And we see more on this in the following saying, we're on 37 now. His students said, when will you appear to us and when shall we see you? Yeshua said, when you strip naked without being ashamed and take your clothes and put them under your feet like small children and trample them, then you will see the child of the living one and you will not be afraid. It's extraordinary, right? Because it's it's so counterintuitive, right? We have dreams about like, you know, showing up at school or work and realizing you have no pants on and stuff like that. We're afraid of being naked. And he's saying, no, becoming naked is how you become free of fear, right? So one could interpret this. And of course, when I say interpret, we, ha we have no idea <laughs> if he would agree with any of these interpretations, right? Um, and of course, I'm in, I tend to interpret more from, you know, the lens of, of, of the non-dual philosophy of Tantra. But I would suggest to you that this becoming naked has to do with um, unapologetically being what you are moment to moment. Right. And when I say unapologetically, like, I mean, in the deepest sense, of course, we make mistakes and we apologize for them. Please keep doing that. You know, it's part of our social discourse and inner interaction. And apology is, is something that happens when we realize um, that, that a moment of unconsciousness, in a moment of unconsciousness, we've unintentionally facilitated pain for another, and we're grieving that, and we express that grief through an apology. But at, the, at a deeper level, right, um, inhabiting fully the awareness that you can't be different from how you are in any moment, and that that's absolutely perfect. You shouldn't be different from how you are. So in a sense, being naked is being completely free from the false belief, I am not as I should be, right? And if you're free of the false belief, I'm not as I should be, then you don't try to be anything other than what you are in that moment. And I'm not, this is not contradictory with engaging a process of change and growth talking moment to moment in each present moment, radical acceptance of what you are, which simply means how life expresses through you. 
and it might be awkward and it might be messy and you might say things that you later regret and all that stuff, but it's also how life is expressing through you. So maybe it's too much modern psychology, but we could say that this being naked also involves um, non non self censoring on the basis of an imagination of what you think other people want, you know, authentic, spontaneous expression. So even if your authentic, spontaneous expression is not well received by others, that is part of the process. So this is, you know, something that, um, my friend Mark Davis, who's a who's a psychologist and a and a hypnotherapist, he's in the group. He he sometimes comments at some length, and we disagree about a lot of things. But we really agree on this, which is in terms of what what form of social interaction supports and facilitates the awakening process best. Answer: Allow authentic, spontaneous expression, moment to moment, as best you can, and then grow and learn from whatever happens, you know, even if it's a disaster, seemingly, even if it's a train wreck, you know, your spontaneous, authentic expression creates a challenging scenario. From the awakening perspective, we say that challenging scenario is exactly what needed to happen. It's exactly what should happen. As long as you are being as authentic as possible, as long as you're speaking the truth as well as you can perceive it in that moment, then whatever happens is exactly what should happen and better sooner than later. Because when we don't, when we delay speaking truth, the consequences are sometimes greater. The, 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 the train wreck is sometimes bigger, you know? And I love this, this image, right? Um, Yeshua says, when you, you not only strip naked, he says, strip naked without being ashamed, right? That's that freedom from I'm not as I should be, right? But not only that, take those clothes, take that, that, you know, socially constructed identity, take that raft of, of shoulds, you know, put it under your feet like small children and trample them. <laughs> it's wonderful. The shortest saying in the gospel uh, is number 42. Yeshua said, be passersby. I take it to mean you realize we're here for such a short time. Show up, be a witness, be in the world, but not of it. Right? Witness not in this in this spiritually bypassing way, this transcendentalistic way, you know, but but um being willing to show up and and witness you know, we say hold space for other beings and ourselves. We're up to 48. Yeshua said, if two make peace with each other in one house, they will tell a mountain, move, and the mountain will move. <laughs> so even though Consciousness manifests as both harmony and chaos. In the context of harmony, things are possible that are not possible in the context of chaos and discord. Even though chaos and discord is perfectly divine too, it's part of what consciousness wants to do or else it wouldn't be doing it. And yet we acknowledge when we find harmony, then 
things are possible that are otherwise not. Saying, oops, saying number 50. This is another mysterious one. Yeshua said, if they say to you, where have you come from? Say to them, we have come from the light, from the place where the light came into being by itself, established itself and appeared in their image. If they say to you, is it you? Say, we are its children and the chosen of the living father. And if they ask you, what is the evidence of your father in you? Say to them, it is motion and rest. So this parallels tantric spanda doctrine, right? This um, spontaneous dynamism within consciousness that expresses as activity and repose, endless pulsations of activity and repose. It's so, it's such an amazing saying, right? It's the, uh, I love these ones that are, um, they're unpredictable, you know? What is, what is the evidence of your father in you? It is motion and rest. <laughs> okay, so my idea here is to, is to um, you know, share a few more sayings and then have discussion um, after a little, a few more sayings, then a little meditation and then a little um, discussion. Um, by the way, in the Gospel of Thomas, we also have some exchanges with women, such as Miriam and Salome. So that's pretty important, right? It shows that the, these secret teachings were given to women as well. Such as this excerpt from, uh, from saying number um, 61. Salome said, who are you, master? I think that's a typo, mister for master. Who are you, master? You have climbed on my couch and eaten from my table as if you are from someone. Yeshua said to her, I am the one who comes from what is whole. I was given from the things of my father. And Salome clearly feels something's going on here because she, <laughs> at that moment, enters discipleship. Salome said, I am your student. Yeshua said, I say, if you are whole, you will be filled with light, but if divided, you will be filled with darkness. Yet another parallel to the uh, non-dual tantric teachings that say um, the goal of the path can be characterized as becoming undivided. And then we recognize and realize the light of consciousness. Sixty-three, saying 63, here we see Yeshua's um, anti-materialistic theme. It appears <laughs> in many places. There was a rich person who was very wealthy, Yeshua said. The rich person said, I shall invest my money so I may sow, reap, plant, and fill my storehouses with produce. Then I shall lack nothing. This is what he was thinking in his heart. But that very night he died. Whoever has ears should hear. <laughs> okay. 
saying 66, show me the stone that the builders rejected. That is the head cornerstone. So this is a saying that um, was hugely important in the spiritual journey of Bob Marley, actually. He, he, he has a song about it, um, but also Mike Snyder. And uh, in Mike Snyder's book, um, The Triune Self, he talks, I think, I think it's there, he talks about this. Um, so I'll just refer you, <laughs> refer you to that source. Okay, jumping towards the, more towards the end. Yeshua said, from me, all has come forth. And I argue he's, he's talking about the experience of every um, self-realized being. He's not saying, he's not speaking solipsistically the way he gets interpreted by Christians, you know, when he says, I am the light, <laughs> you know, just, yeah, just him. Um, in fact, just before this, he says, I am the light over all things. I am all. And then from me, all has come forth and to me, all has reached. Totally the same as Kshemadaja's teaching in the Recognition Sutras on the five acts. From me, all has come forth and to me, all has reached. And then he says, split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up a stone and you will find me. Can't get much more non-dual than that, right? One who seeks will find, for one who knocks, it will be opened. Getting to the end now, here's another mysterious one. The Father's kingdom is like a woman who took a little yeast, hid it in dough, and made large loaves of bread. Whoever has ears should hear. Very parallel to the uh, Upanishadic non-dual passages, right? About how you can't find the salt in salty water. It's everywhere in the water, pervades the water, and yet is not... Uh, findable as an object. Saying number 108. Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person and the hidden things will be revealed to that one.
Okay, last one saying 113. His students said to him, when will the kingdom come? Yeshua said, it will not come because you're watching for it. No one will announce, look, here it is, or look, there it is. The kingdom is spread out upon the earth and people don't see it. So letting these teachings simmer deep inside without thinking of them, but just tasting the flavor, the flavor of consciousness evoked by these secret teachings of the living Jesus. Um. So I'll just finish my section with um, 
this story from Krishna Das. And I posted a story about his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, also known as Maharaji. One day, a Canadian man arrived for his first visit with Neem Karoli Baba. He didn't know much about Maharaji, but had heard of him. Maharaji didn't give lectures or formal teachings. He didn't write books, and as far as I know, didn't formally initiate people. He just kept shining like the sun. When Maharajji asks, asked this man why he'd come and what he wanted, the man was unsure how to respond. And finally he replied, can you teach me how to meditate? Maharajji's response was, meditate like Christ. We asked this man about his darshan, his one-on-one -on -one moment with Maharajji. He told us that Maharajji had said to meditate like Christ, and at first we were surprised. What? Meditate like Christ? What does that mean? But when, then we thought about it. We were always trying to get Maharajji to tell us what practice to do, but he'd never give us any specific instructions about yoga or meditation. Now he'd said this. If he said it, he must know how Jesus meditated. We decided to ask him about it. We were so excited we were going to get the secret teachings at last. Later in the day, when Maharajji came back, came to the back of the temple to hang out with the Westerners, one of us broached the subject that had us all buzzing. You said to meditate like Christ. How did he meditate? It seemed as, as if Maharajji was about to answer, but instead his eyes closed and he sat there completely still, completely silent. It felt like he'd totally disappeared. And all the time I'd been with him, says Krishnadas, I'd only seen him sitting motionless like this a couple of times before. It was extraordinarily powerful, as if the whole universe had become silent. Then a tear came down his cheek. We were in awe. After a couple of minutes, his eyes half opened and with great emotion, he quietly said, he lost himself in love. That's how he meditated. He was one with all beings. He loved everyone, even the people who crucified him. He never died. He is in the hearts of all. He lost himself in love. So lastly, I'll just show you what, um, what the Gospel of Thomas actually looks like. There are the first two pages of the Codex Unicus, the single manuscript of the Gospel of Thomas. Coptic Egyptian language. So Egyptian could be written in multiple scripts, and this is a Coptic version. And the reason we know how to translate it is uh, because of the Rosetta Stone, 
that's a whole interesting linguistic history that I won't get into. Um, there's lots of good translations of Gospel of Thomas and um, that gnosis.org site has five. Um, yeah, you can explore, find out which one is resonant because they're, 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 there's a lot of good ones. Okay, shares, comments, questions. What, what strikes you most powerfully in this um, body of teaching? Some, someone can speak out loud. Paul, is, is that you um, speaking up or did you accidentally unmute? Hmm. For some reason, I don't hear you. Do you guys hear him? No. Okay. <laughs> so your mic seems to not be working, Paul. I see you're unmuted. Paul is transmitting in silence. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we'll come back to you, Paul. Who else would like to share? I like the whole thing of getting naked, being transparent, and not being ashamed. That really resonates with me. Thank you, Gary. Just don't take it literally, at least not while you're on camera, okay? <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for the heads up. I, Who I, else? Was so, <clears throat> I was so amazed. I am so amazed at the similarity with the non duality, the tantric. It's so, like, right on in such so many different ways in the depth of the teachings. I'd always, you know, we'd always heard like the kingdom of God lies within, but I never realized. Um, how thorough it was and complete. It wasn't just a peek or a glimpse or extract this to convey your own view, but how broad it is in the statement of non-duality. Very amazing, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, you might even say, you know, it's, it's I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in the Gospel of Thomas, but if it is the secret teachings he only gave to a few people, then it, there's an argument to be made that his secret teaching was non-duality, you know, which is kind of extraordinary. And isn't it amazing that it is roughly like a thousand years before the Tantric out of India or so? Yeah, and uh, that brings me to um, uh, just a, a brief mention of like, oh, the possibility of influence. Um, of course, the earliest tantric sources are in the in the 400s, um, late 400s, and you know, non-duality is is flourishing in tantra by by about the year 800. Um, some people have proposed the possibility that um, not specifically these teachings of the Gospel of Thomas, but rather the non-duality of of Plotinus. Uh, might have made its way because you see the Silk the Silk Route up until the fall of the Roman Empire the Silk Route uh, Silk Road was very much open and there was communication back and forth between Northwest India and um, uh, the the Greco Roman world and North or Northwest India that's where tantric teachings first appear possibility of some influence in some way of um, these Neoplatonism teachings you know, come from people like Plotinus, uh, which certainly predate and only a little bit predate uh, the tantric teachings, so, but who knows? Um, who else? I love this today, Harish, and um, 
I have a glancing acquaintance with the Gospel of Thomas, but the thunder perfect mind when I, I know nothing about. So I just wanted to encourage you to do another such session on that. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, you know, this is this is a point that uh, Chris Tompkins and I um, agree on that, you know, that Thunder Perfect Mind, it's this, this self-revelation of the divine feminine within the Gnostic tradition. It just feels so, so consonant and so resonant with, um, you know, the, the kind of vibe in a way of, of Paravak, who in, in the Chuma Sanketa Prakasha, I read to you guys the other day, she has a self revelation there, you know, she, she reveals herself and speaks to um, the, the author, the narrator in this really powerful, compelling way, you know. Um, so let's see, there's this. Uh, I'll read you just a tiny bit from Thunder Perfect Mind. I was sent forth from the power and I have come to those who reflect upon me and I have been found among those who seek after me. Look upon me, you who reflect upon me, you who are waiting for me, take me to yourselves. Do not banish me from your sight for I am the first and the last I am the honored and the scorned. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin, the mother and the daughter. And I am all the limbs of my mother. I am the barren one and many are her sons. I am she whose wedding is great and I have not taken a husband. I am the midwife and she who does not bear. I am the solace of my labor pains. I am the bride and the bridegroom and it is my husband who begot me. And I am the silence that is incomprehensible the voice whose sound is manifold and the word whose appearance is multiple. I am the utterance of my name. I am knowledge and ignorance shame and boldness. I am strength and I am fear. I am shameless and I am ashamed. I am war and peace. The one who is disgraced and the great one. Be vigilant. I am compassionate and I am cruel. Do not be afraid of my power. I am she who exists in all fears and strength in trembling, both senseless and wise. I am the one who has been hated everywhere and loved everywhere. I am the one whom they call life and who you have called death. I am the one whom they call law and whom you have called lawlessness. Mm. I am the one whose God is great and I am godless. 
I am she who does not keep festival and I am she whose festivals are many. I am the one you have reflected upon and scorned. I am unlearned and they learn from me. I am the one whom you have hidden from and you appear to me. So yeah, it goes on. It's, it's pretty awesome. And so it's non-dual, of course, because, you know, she's saying, I am all these dichotomies and, and, and the full spectrum, you know, of which the dichot dichotomies form ends, as it were. And there's this parallel teaching in the esoteric trika of, of Abhinavagupta and his lineage, whereby, you know, it's, it's, it's only in some versions of the trika, like Abhinavagupta's, where it's taught that Kali and Paradevi are each equally expressions of each other. And some of these dichotomies that she's listing there are exactly those, you know, life and death, law and lawlessness, you know, the light and the dark, because Paradevi is always visualized as luminous white light, you know, having a luminous white light body and being abundant and, you know, uh, full-bodied and Kali as the impenetrable darkness, you know, and if, if visualized anthropomorphically as emaciated as the apparent opposite of the, the visualization of Paradevi, and yet the ultimate understanding is that each expresses as the other, not that one is a, a step, stepped down emanation of the other, but they're equally expressions of the other. And that's, you know, the so-called secret teaching at the heart of, uh, of Abhinavagupta's um, theology, as it were. <clears throat> oh, there's a bunch of comments now. Yeah, Shankanil points out, um, of course, non-duality in India predates, you know, predates um, Jesus, right? For example, in Upanishads like the Chandogya, we have clear articulations of non-duality hundreds of years before Jesus, right? So uh, I, I, I wasn't saying, um, I wasn't contradicting that. I was just saying that the particular form of non-duality we see in Neoplatonism might have influenced early Tantra uh, because of some parallel articulations that we find um, that others have, have uh, scholars have written about a little bit. Yeah, Paul says, I just wanted to say I enjoyed this, never really doubting that there was something of non-duality in Jesus's teaching, but never feeling any interest in pursuing it. It's a nice way to temper my annoyance with Christianity, which I know is kind of a contradiction, contradiction to my core values. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I, I, for a long time, I thought I hated Christianity and then I discovered, no, it's just that I don't like Christians, <laughs> not Christians, some, some, some Christians, right? <laughs> it's, it's really, it's not even that. It's that I don't like um, dogmatism and evangelism and certain principles that are not universal to Christianity actually at all. So we get influenced by what we get exposed to, you know. When I was in, in, in university, they had, uh, when I was in undergrad, they had, you know, campus crusade for Christ. These poor brainwashed undergrads thought if they actually believed if they didn't convert they, they could go to hell, even though they'd accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They had to uh, then convert others to, be, to, to guarantee their salvation, you know. Um,
Okay. Daryush, what would you like to share? Anyone can raise their hand, by the way, and get, get in the queue here. It's not a share, it's more like a question. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that humanity in different cultures and in different circumstances, we keep discovering the same cosmic, and I think the emphasis is cosmic archetypes, but we give it different form and shapes and expressions, and we call them different spiritual traditions. And they're essentially some form of perennial philosophy that we keep discovering the same things again and again, and we just fight over it and beat each other up, essentially for the same truth. Yeah. Well, it, it depends, right? Because um, uh, the argument for the perennial philosophy that um, Aldous Huxley and others made, um, right? He published that famous book around 1950 called The Perennial Philosophy. You can find this perennial, all embracing, non dual philosophy everywhere in every religion and every culture, but in most cultures, it was not dominant. Uh, you know, it was not the dominant view. And even even in India, that's the case. Like we have a kind of, as Westerners studying kind of Eastern wisdom, we have a skewed picture of things because in India, non-dual teachings were never, you know, more popular. <laughs> they were, they were um, indeed uh, less, you know, numerically speaking, uh, significantly less popular than dualistic and quasi-dualistic teachings. Um, so we find the perennial, perennial philosophy everywhere by looking for it, you know, and lots of people are espousing, you know, something, something very different. What, you know, so fundamentalist Christians and Hare Krishnas, their discourse is actually very, very similar. Um, you know, the Hare Krishnas say, you know, Krishna is the supreme Godhead and you need to accept that truth and reject other divinities. And if you say, oh, but Shiva and Krishna, those are just different names for the one, they'll say, no, no, that's not true. They're different persons. They're different supernatural beings. And Krishna is the God of the universe and Shiva isn't. And, uh, you know, so <laughs> it, it all just depends on who you're talking to, right? We see, um, you know, so it's, it's like I've said in one of the near enemies talks, it's not the case to say, that the, all these traditions are saying the same thing or that they all point to the same goal. But it is true to say, just like you, you're alluding to, Daryush, that, um, that the same truth can be found everywhere. It's irrepressible. And Abhinava Gupta talks about this very beautifully. Um, and, I, and I have this, I, I, I mentioned this in Tantra Illuminated toward the end of the philosophy section where Abhinava Gupta talks about how, you know, it's hidden like the oil in sesame seeds. It's, it's hidden everywhere in all traditions. And Abhinava Gupta says, you can read dualistic scriptures and find hints of the non-dual like clues left for you in a way, you know? Um, and it's a fascinating uh, perspective, right? That, yeah, that the truth is, is in, terms of, in terms of religions, you know, it's, it's, it's hidden as a thread and everywhere and yet, you have to have the eyes to see or the ears to hear, as Jesus said, you know. Um, Amber. Hello. Um, I'm curious, this may be like really obvious and maybe a dumb question, but um, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, it talks about the tree, the tree of good and evil, or the, you know, of, no, of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you think that that was talking about non-duality? Is that? No. Um, I mean, here I, I would uh, defer to uh, Joseph Campbell's reading of the of the myth of the fall. I think it's I think it's very perspicacious. I, not to say that there's one right reading or anything, right? But um, his reading makes a lot of sense, which is that um, 
you know, prior to eating of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve are like animals, you know, they're like all the other animals, I should say. Um, they have no self-consciousness, they're running around naked, they're not, they have no shame, you know. Um, that sounds they're, great. They're in the infantile <laughs> non-dual state, right? Then they eat, the, the tree is, is, if anything, it's the opposite, it's the tree of duality, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil is the tree of the concept of good and evil. Mm. And it's immediately after eating that fruit, Bible doesn't say it was an apple, by the way. <laughs> it just says fruit. Um, and fruit fruit also means result, right? But they, they eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And immediately, what do they do? They look down at themselves and they're like, oh, shit, better cover up down here. <laughs> you know, this part's maybe not so okay. So in other words, they have shame. They develop shame. They, de they start, you know, the process of like uh, differentiation and social conditioning and everything. And that's the real fall, you know, in, in a sense. But also the fall has to happen, right? So it's, it's just like we have to shift from the infantile state of non-duality to a state of duality as, as older children and teenagers to, uh, to then reach toward the possibility of a mature adult state of non-duality, you know? Um, so, you know, um, they're, they're, they're cast out, right? But in, if you, if you re read it in this way, it's not like a, it's not like a punishment. It's like they're starting the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell puts it. They have to be cast out, right? They have to go on the journey. They have to undergo the trials. They have to find allies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you come, come back to the, to the garden in, in, in realization or, or salvation or awakening or whatever you want to call it, but you're coming back as an adult and, you know, as opposed to this infantile version, um, right? Con corroborated also by the Upanishads that have this interesting saying, um, all animals and all children, little children are merged in the absolute, but they don't know that they are. So anyway, um, there's there's a lot you can do actually with uh, you know with that myth. <laughs> there's a lot a lot of interesting possible exegesis. Um, my my Kabbalah teacher back when I was learning some of that, he liked to point out what are the very first words spoken by God in the Bible. There when he's looking for Adam in the garden and says, "Where are you?" And like, wait a second, this is God. Like he doesn't know where Adam is. <laughs> no, he's saying, where are you in a deeper sense? <laughs> where are you, dude? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, just a note also that for these Gnostic Christians who flourished up, up, up until the 300s, um, some of the Gnostic groups argued that the God of the Old Testament and the God that Jesus talked about were actually two different gods. They absolutely saw the incredible and irreconcilable dichotomy of Jesus's God of love and compassion and forgiveness and this really petty, jealous, tyrant God of the, of the Old Testament that we find, you know, that tells his followers to just, just kill everyone in that town, man, woman, and child and everything. Um, so these Gnostics argued that there were two gods, the, the real God, and then the, what they called the Demiurge. And their argument was um, that the real God, you know, deputized the Demiurge to create the world. And so the creator, you know, was this deputized figure who then grew all conceited about his creation and, and kind of went off the rails and developed what, what we call God realm delusion um, in Tantra. And so, you know, the Gnostics claim, oh, we follow the, the real God. And, you know, some of these other guys over here um, have got it confused. So anyway, it's a whole kind of fascinating <laughs> um, history there. Um, so this, this ditheism that they uh, argued for was, of course, uh, rejected by the mainstream church. Um, Okay, what are, you, what are you guys saying here in the chat thread? <laughs> oh 
my gosh, has it been that long already? <laughs> That's amazing. Feels like 40 minutes. It's an hour, 40 minutes. Okay, um, just a couple more quick shares before we uh, wrap it up. Um, John. Yes, I came to this uh, because I thought you might have some interesting thoughts uh, like your, your, somebody you studied with, Adya Shanti, uh, Julie Davis already talked about resurrecting genius, Jesus. He had several ideas about eternity being inflected into uh, the becoming moment and also the archetypes in the canonical gospels. But you focused in on the koan-like nature of, I wanted to ask you about these, these like paradoxes that keep cropping up. Are they Jesus's pointing out instructions to to kind of attain it, awakening? Was this a kind of like a like almost like a way, almost like the koan of breaking through language? To go back to what you were saying earlier about exclusion and and how the language traps us in dualism. Yeah, I mean, you could you could read it that way. This this theme is much more strongly articulated in that uh, Thunder Perfect Mind text. Um, and we see it very, very clearly in, in Tantric Shaivism. Uh, and one of my former teachers, Paul Muller Ortega, was f fond of saying, and probably still is, um, the divine is that which transcends and yet subsumes all apparent paradoxes that in his reading of, of Tantric Shaiva tradition, that that's one of the key kind of definitions of divinity, that which transcends and yet subsumes within itself all apparent paradoxes. And so he argues, whenever you see a paradox, you're being invited to zoom out to a big picture view and see how that those apparent opposites are held within a greater unity. And that's true of all opposites that each each occupy ends of a spectrum so they're expressions of each other and then there's the that which unifies them the unity of the spectrum itself you know so this is certainly a theme in, in tantric shaivism and, and somewhat of a theme in these um esoteric uh teachings of of yeshua as well and certainly embraced by gnostics again we don't know if that thunder perfect mind text was one that was embraced by Gnostic Christians, because there were Gnostics around at that time that were not Christians as well. Um, there was a whole kind of incredible ferment of spiritual activity that 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 didn't survive the 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 late Roman Empire, you know. Um, but yeah, I think we see this this paradoxical use of language and in, in non-dual mystics the world over. Right? And it resurges in the Christian sh tradition as well, because you have figures like Meister Eckhart, who had no access to these Nag Hammadi texts, which were still lost at his time. And yet he ends up asserting the same apparently paradoxical language um, to talk about the all subsuming nature of the Godhead. You know? So anyone who's not investigated uh, Meister Eckhart, you know, he's one of the great um, Christian mystics, he's, he's so far out there uh, in terms of, from the perspective of mainstream Christianity, he came really close to getting excommunicated uh, by the church, you know? So some of the Christian mystics had to hide their mysticism, you know, more than, more than others. And he was, uh, he was, he was willing to be risky. He's a, he's a fascinating figure. And he's the fellow that Eckhart Tolle named himself after, by the way. Because okay. Eckhart Tolle's real name is Ulrich Tulla, and uh, he but he he loves Meister Eckhart, so he took that name. Thanks. Yeah. Michael, do you have a quick one? Yeah, just very quick. Um, is this incongruous? I, I don't know. It's a dumb question, but on the one hand, he's saying the Father's kingdom is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. But on the other hand, it's here's my secret teachings. Yeah, well, the thing is that um, that teaching, you know, 
that teaching is even found like like um, Catherine was saying that teachings found a little bit in the canonical gospels as well you know the kingdom of heaven is within but um he gives a he gives a stronger it's it's almost as if he might have had different levels of teaching to some he said the kingdom of heaven is within it appears in john for example um but then here he's saying it's within and without you know he's hinting towards the dissolution of that very dichotomy you know um so when you have the eyes to see you'll see the kingdom is is right here all around you you know now, what does it mean to have secret teachings? This is also a theme in the tantric tradition, right? Where scholars argue, how should we translate rahasya, the word rahasya, secret or esoteric? Because they're not really secret, are they? Because we have them, <laughs> you know? They're esoteric teachings that, that some are not, not gonna be qualified for or not gonna understand, which is actually amounts to the same thing. You know, if you're not, if you can't understand them, then that, that's the evidence that you're not yet qualified for them, <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's, we might say these so-called secret teachings are just more inner level teachings uh, for those, for those who are, are ready to kind of uh, progress to that, you know? And, you know, to, to, why should there be, why should teachings occupy levels in this way? There, I think there's a very good reason for it, you know? There's this interesting, um, you know, this has sort of been kicking around in my head whether to share with you guys, but you know, in 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 this one time in some in some kind of live teaching context, you know, Byron Katie went off about the about the vision of of radical non duality and and reconciling it with the horrors of you know, for example, the Second World War, and what she says there is exactly the sort of thing that that you would. Uh, get stoned for or crucified, right? I was, I was thinking about that earlier when I didn't go there. Um, and it's a really fascinating little segment because it's, it, and, and that really helps people, it could help people understand why there, there are levels of teaching and why, because if somebody receives this teaching when they're not ready for it, they're just going to say, okay, no, fuck that. They're just going to reject the whole thing. Um, and when they receive it at the right moment, it could be the 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 engine for a huge kind of leap forward in their awakening process. But this the reason that teachings are gated like this is because if you've already rejected the teaching, then you have a samskara about it, you know, and then you, you don't get to encounter it fresh when you're more ready for it. So there, that's why. Um, Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a big topic, but anyway, this this segment of Byron Katie, um, what's fascinating is you know the the where I heard it was on the Conspirituality podcast where Matthew Remsky is sharing it as an example of how badly wrong non dual teachings can go of how of how horrible <laughs> non dual teachings can go, you know, and 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 I would argue it's because you know. He doesn't really understand what's being said, but they're like Katie is being this just like unapologetically radically non-dual, and but but still using 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 sometimes God language, which kind of can confuse the issue a little bit. But you know, I I, I want to share it with you guys and see what you what you think about it because. It's fascinating to hear it in this context. It's being presented by Remsky in the context of. Listen to how crazy these non-dual people can get. This is fucked up shit. And, you know, but if you understand what she's trying to get at, but language, you know, it's a language issue also, the language escapes it, then you might realize, no, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is it, you know? Um, anyway, it's a potentially hugely controversial <laughs> passage. I don't know if I want to put it in the Tantric Yoga Now group. It would be a kind of firestorm probably. That could be why Thomas said, uh, "Yeah, told you, you'd stone me." Totally, yeah. totally, and and it's the and it's totally the reason that uh, Jed McKenna is non a non public figure. You know, uh, you know that we it's it's he wants to be able to say these radically non dual things, which could get him, uh, you know, 
uh, crucified in one way or another, right? In, in modern culture, it's, you know, it's being canceled, but being, when people are, are, are canceled, you know, that is, that's, they can really lose, they can lose every, I know people who have, you've been canceled and literally lose all their income and, and their job and their career and their livelihood um, because they said the wrong thing, you know? But anyway, um, we'll see. We'll see where I share it. <laughs> um, ben, go for it. Hey, thank you. Um, in Thunder Perfect Mind. Could you repeat the line where it said something to the effect of I am the utterance of my own name? Is that? Yeah, yeah, this bit is, is really. Um... Is that saying simultaneously I am in expressing my, in Shakti, I'm simultaneously expressing being like a, or a million things that started going off for me when, when you read that. Yeah, so this is the part that, um, let me see if I can find it again. This is the part that um, really strongly parallels, you know, uh, Paravak, Paradevi's uh, self-revelation. This, this is one of my favorite bits of the text. Um, I am the silence that is incomprehensible and the idea whose remembrance is frequent. I am the voice whose sound is manifold and the word whose appearance is multiple. I am the utterance of my name. So parallels the tantric teaching that the, that the mantra, that, that, that the mantra is the, is the true name of the deity, right? And embodies the deity, is the direct expression mm -hmm. of the deity. Mm -hmm. And the next line, which I didn't read, she says, why, you who hate me, do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> right? And we see this theme in the Indian tradition too, where, yeah. um, you know, where those who hate God with pure and perfect intensity, such that they think of nothing other than God, mm -hmm. merge, with, merge mm -hmm. with the absolute when they leave this body. You know, <laughs> to hate the divine is, is, is to be in relationship with the divine and that cannot mm -hmm. waste as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Well, I, I hope, uh, someone said it earlier, but please, I mean, that's one I think you should do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Good. Maybe we'll stop there. So let's go to uh, gallery view. Yeah, um, somebody in the chat thread mentions Ibn, Ibn Arabi. He's sort of like the Abhinavagupta of the Sufis. Um, yeah, oh, do you have a book there, Eric? Oops, I just lost your image. Know yourself, oops, hold it more still. No, oh, the resolution's not good enough can post the name of it. Um, 
anyway, uh, yeah, I, we keep meaning to make a thread about this, but you can find these parallel figures in all the traditions, right? Like Ibn Arabi, it's amazing how parallel he is to, to Ibn of Agupta, but in a Sufi uh, context. Um, and then we have, you know, parallels in Jewish Kabbalah, like from Isaac of Luria, um, and, you know, in, in all the traditions. Well, nice to see y'all. <laughs> nice to share this um, special holiday gathering. I think Yeshua would like it if we, um, you know, send, uh, it, you know, he was, he was into metta meditation, loving kindness meditation, or so it would seem. He also had a tough side, by the way, you know, <laughs> when, when uh, a disciple said to Jesus, um, you know, how their, how their parents rejected them for following him. And he's like, I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. I'll divide mother from uh, son and father from, you know, it's like he says this crazy thing of like, look, if that's the price of following, following your truth, do it, you know, and he even, he even uh, is, is willing to reject his own family, right, when they come to the door and he's like, no, they're, they're not my family, uh, those who are walking the, the path are my family, you know, um, so he could be, he could be this really, you know, harsh person also, but I think, um, you know, uh, loving kindness meditation is, <laughs> is in line with um, his, his ethos, right? So let's send uh, loving kindness to each person on the call. A few people have already dropped off, but we're still sending it to you. Um, so it's just generating this feeling in your heart that corresponds to these words. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be healthy, happy, and well. May you be free. May you realize your freedom. May you realize your divinity. May you celebrate the divinity of life. May you realize your innate beauty. May you realize your worth is proven by your very existence and your very being generates value. So having generated that feeling, please send it to each other, to everyone in this community, but especially all those of us right here, right now. <sighs> Om.
Happy holidays. May you experience your blessedness and fullness. Happy New Year. New Year's just a mental construct. You guys know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no such thing, but still, you know. <laughs> whatever the next the next let, let's say the next turn of the seasons <laughs> may it be blessed for you and see you soon those of you on patreon um will have a webinar in just a few days on chuma sanketa prakasha see you then om